So I'm, I'm actually going to uh, focus in on Ghana as a case study, uh, looking at all of the factors and dynamics to a certain degree that she has uh, outlined in her overviews of uh, migration, water, uh, and, and women issues in Africa. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is talk about women, gender, and migration, link it to the need for the right to water, sanitation, and hygiene, which my organization that I'm here um, representing Water Aid uh, in Ghana, uh, that we do we fight for the right of African people and people all over the world in fact to have water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, so, I'm going to look at some of the research that's been done on, on migration and gender and water issues in, in Ghana, look at the migratory trends that have been happening, and link these with some of the socioeconomic conditions of rural women and, and their status as a consequence of poor uh, rural wash coverage in Ghana. Um, I'll talk about quickly some of the factors that uh, influence women's lives food security issues, livelihood issues, and, and how these are also linked to issues of water, disaster, and climatic change that shape their mi migration patterns and decisions. And I will end then with talking a little bit specifically about what we're doing at WaterAid in, in Ghana to address some of these issues, how we are engaging government to some degree, uh, some of the programs that we're trying to put in place, as well as how we're trying to work with other uh, organizations to um, achieve uh, Millennium Development Goals 1, 3, and for us, 7, which is um, in looking at environment issues where the, the WASH agenda, water sanitation and hygiene agenda is embedded. So um, to start out with, um, we know that in, in West Africa, as uh, Professor O'Connor said, people move a lot. Um, nomadic peoples and traders move throughout uh, West Africa through some very um, um, significant trade routes. Um, starting in the, from the fourth century, we have the Kingdom of Ghana, uh, also known as Wadalubu, which arose in the Niger, Niger River Valley. Um, the capital of that empire was, was also called Ghana, not, not the geopolitical space that we're talking about, that's today's Ghana. But ancient Ghana um, allowed, um, controlled a lot of the, the, the spaces and, and trading uh, areas between northern and southern Africa until the emergence of the uh, Kingdom of Mali. So early patterns of migration in Africa reflected movement of people across the continent seeking not only to trade and pursue livelihood, but also, as was mentioned, to escape war, occupation, and slavery from Arab and Arabs in the 17th, 7th century, and then later Europeans uh, in the 19th century. So due to its central location, the, at that time, the Kingdom of Ghana was a key uh, crossroads of migratory patterns and routes in uh, West Africa. Now today, fast forward, uh, today, these, these migration routes have been changed by the colonial experience and the boundaries that now exist that regulate people's movement. Um, and structures like ECOWAS, which have uh, been set up and that are supposed to be promoting um, trade and movement of people in, in West Africa, have done some something to facilitate it, but not uh, much. Um, at any rate, we know that now in, in West Africa, uh, the migration patterns are characterized by the increasing um, rural to urban migration trend as modern cities in the new territory, <coughs> territorial state of Ghana exists, where we have cities such as Accra, Kumasi, uh, Tamale, and other areas have emerged to be uh, major uh, magnet areas for not only traders, but also young migrants, young uh, males and females who are moving um, from the rural areas seeking uh, work, um, livelihoods, and educational opportunities, among other things. So, you can't hear me. That's Can better. you hear me? That's better. Oh, okay. 
and demographic change, we see that in Ghana in particular, there's been uh, dramatic changes in fertility rates, um, population growth rates have declined, um, and um, death rates. Um, all of this has led to some of the classification of Ghana as being, uh, last year, it was classified as a middle-income middle country. Okay, um, but despite that, uh, Ghana uh, still, and many people there, still remain relatively poor uh, in comparisons to um, other parts of the world. Ghana, as we know, is uh, touted as a nation that has over the past been a good IMF uh, pupil and has done well in terms of achieving many social indicators of development. It also draws attention as it remains one of the few countries in, in Africa and West Africa that has avoided large-scale conflicts since independence in 1957. But despite uh, these um, um, uh, accolades, the IMF and uh, World Bank structural adjustment processes um, have, have shaped the Ghanaian economy and um, you know, there are many scholars who have critiques of structural adjustment and whether or not it has benefited the majority of people in Ghana and that at a micro, uh, that, that some of the indicators have been uh, pretty much measured at the macro level while not looking at micro level uh, measures of, of people's um, material well-being. Um, they also argue that the impact of structural adjustment programs in Ghana on the poor and vulnerable groups in both rural and urban areas has uh, been disturbing. And so there's many other studies that are, you know, uh, both pro and con in terms of structural adjustment. Uh, so when we talk about uh, water uh, migration uh, and um, gender issues in Ghana, there are several concepts that are contested. Of course, gender is always one um, that is contested. Um, we are also looking at issues around integrated wash and water sanitation and hygiene, the informal sector, uh, rural urban migration, urbanization. All of these concepts have provided lens through which we have to look at what is happening in Ghana in terms of um, migration and people's access to water sanitation and hygiene. But nevertheless, uh, over the years, what we know in Ghana is that there has been this rapid urbanization. And so people have been moving for one reason or another. And what we find and the work that we do with WaterAid, including in um, urban areas, is to work with communities to try to provide water, sanitation, and hygiene services in many of the urban slums that are uh, there. So a lot of times when people come to Ghana, they go on their nice tours, but they don't oftentimes make it to some of the urban slum areas and communities that exist, and they are there in all of the major cities. So the implications for addressing rural women's migration, poverty status, and wash needs are also um, essential to highlight because we need to find ways, whether the women are in rural or urban areas, to ensure that government provides um, the access to safe, clean water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, as is known, many of the women and men, particularly from northern Ghana, migrate to the southern part of the country only to find themselves settling in these urban slum areas that I mentioned. And the women and children um, are engaged in um, petty street, uh, street trading and they live uh, often in extremely hazardous um, places and environmentally unsafe and unsanitized areas. Ghana, like most of Africa, is still predominantly rural um, but as stated above, it's, it is urbanizing uh, very fast. As urbanization proceeds in Africa, 
the city and the countryside become differentiated in many ways, and understanding the migration pattern between these two areas becomes increasingly important. The study of sex differences in migration has emerged as a topic of growing interest among researchers over the past two decades. Yet, as Reed and others know, few of these studies have focused on migration within national boundaries, and fewer still have examined moves by both men and women across the lifespan or life course. So when we talk about migration, um, oftentimes people give you a, a picture, a snapshot of what people's lives are at a point in time when in fact people's movements and migration patterns have um, sometimes been uh, over generations, uh, even within families, and people who are, the young people who are now migrating and moving, you can talk to them and find out that they've moved around you know, for many years. Um, so they have different experiences and, uh, at each point in time in their life. So this is very important also to look at when we talk about um, migration, looking at people's uh, life histories around that issue. So much of the uh, existing research on migration in less developed countries also has focused on this rural urban migration and urbanization. But internal migration includes more than movement from rural to urban areas. Recently, more attention has been paid to other types of migration from rural to rural areas, from urban to urban areas, and then the urban to rural areas. So the degree of urbanness also becomes an issue because um, you know, there, there are no longer just pure, strictly urban and rural areas. You have peri-urban and other concepts uh, and locations that are now there. And um, regardless of where people find themselves, um, our work uh, at Water Aid is to um, provide water, uh, sanitation, and hygiene um, wherever uh, the, the poorest and most marginalized are located. So another concept that's important here is the concept of step migration, or the sequence of moves from smaller communities to larger communities, as opposed to people making a single move from the rural community to a large urban area. So there is a nuanced picture that exists with um, migration. So for the purposes of the, this discussion and the remaining time I have, I want to talk about uh, what WaterAid is doing to address uh, rural women's poverty, um, and also, okay, and also um, look at some of the issues, uh, linking some of these issues with climate, climatic variability, um, disasters, and other issues that impact on um, people's lives. Um, there was some research done by Reed on gender, family, and migration between urban and rural areas in, in coastal Ghana uh, using event history analysis. And one of the things that they found was that the coastal regions and areas in Ghana have drawn migrant labor, primarily men, to the fishing and logging industries and to cocoa farms. Large market towns and cities including Cape Coast, Elmina, and Accra have drawn market traders who may be men but are most often women. Their research showed how in most cases in Ghana, especially in the coastal area studies, women had a fair amount of autonomy and female migration for employment, marriage, or family reasons were common. One of the most consistent determinants of migration across almost all societies is age. There is generally high mobility among very young children who are moving with their young adult parents, uh, by the way, uh, at this time. And there's been lower mobility during older uh, uh, children and uh, older aged persons, and increasing mobility in later teens that typically peaks among those in their 20s and then declines steadily in the older ages. This pattern of migration, according to Rogers, holds across a, various, a variety of settings, even though it may shift slightly up and down depending upon um, spatial and economic changes. We also find this pattern in Ghana as well as other parts of Africa. Another 
thing that was important about the research that uh, we conducted was that um, education is um, becoming one of the most influential factors for movements between urban and rural areas, including for women. So as both men and women attain higher levels of education, they tend to move out of the uh, rural areas into the urban and peri-urban areas, um, looking for jobs and economic opportunities. We also found that in Ghana, oh really? Um, well, okay, if I have five minutes left, then what I'll do is I'll leave all of the economic data and statistics alone and say, uh, and focus more on some of the um, more critical issues that I think are facing people who are migrating in, in Ghana, and women in particular. I want to talk about um, the issue of water and migration, exploring the nexus here uh, in Ghana. We, we know that rural women uh, migrate for a number of reasons, age, economic uh, issues, education, uh, etc. But there is also the, the factor of floods and disasters that move people from um, rural areas a lot of times to the urban areas. In northern Ghana, for example, where most of the uh, most impoverished uh, communities are, they have a very dry um, uh, weather, but also are prone to floods throughout different periods of the year. And these uh, floods have caused uh, almost uh, whole communities um, to, to move. And a lot of times when, when people move, they, they move to areas that are not necessarily the safest areas, but that also at some point in time may, uh, may also um, uh, be um, struck by uh, floods or other disasters. Of course, when we have the flooding, we have issues of cholera, issues of um, other waterborne diseases that people now have to navigate. And this is also, we have flooding in Accra. We have flooding in the urban areas as well as in the northern um, and rural areas that people tend to focus on. So um, floods, as I mentioned then, can um, cause uh, outbreaks of diseases, um, lead to um, issues around food security, and, and therefore we have communities and people who are struggling to, um, you know, uh, secure their livelihoods, whether they're in the rural or urban areas. And in northern Ghana, and even in southern Ghana, out-migration, one of the things that this um, leads to is a concern that I have, and that is of local water knowledge and the loss of skills required for coping in the aftermath of floods that might serve to reduce vulnerability of people. Some of the migrants who leave, including women, are equipped with knowledge of indigenous herbal medicine, seeds, and production. And when um, floods and other uh, climatic variability things happen where people move, they take this knowledge and information with them when they move to um, other areas. In WaterAid, we have been working uh, for 25 years in Ghana, and we have been following um, you know, issues around flood and people's movements, um, and working with the government in, in sometimes successful and other times not so successful uh, ways to advocate for uh, households to have um, access to clean, safe water. We do um, projects such as um, providing boreholes, bore um, hand dug wells, but we also in the growing carry urban areas and small towns, we also provide small uh, water small town um, water systems that serve larger um, populations. And a lot of what we're doing still is not enough. Um, as uh, Professor Okome was saying, the issue of uh, access uh, to water, whether you're in either the urban or rural areas, uh, tends to be a factor of your economic situation. And um, poor people, of course, end up spending more of their um, quote unquote disposable income paying for or buying water from uh, the companies that have, uh, the industry or companies that have 
emerged uh, selling water in, in the urban area. So that's that's a problem. And so we try to work um, and um, provide. We used to do a lot more of subsidy, subsidizing um, people's uh, ability to have water, but we are also doing other uh, things uh, now. I, I'm out of time. Um, well, I think maybe if we have a chance for a question and answer. I can talk a little bit more about our work and any, entertain any of the um, questions that you may have. I'll stop.